Professor Jenna Montgomery is a scholar, educator, and activist. Her scholarship examines the role of money and finance in connecting systems of oppression. She analyzes how money impacts the household and why debt is necessary for many individuals to access the complex system of housing, work, consumption, education, health, and social care. Her community-based research is interwoven in academic publications and educational practices around money management in the home. Um, as an activist, she seeks to demystify money and finance using home economics as a lens to consider how personal finance relates to the social justice concerns of marginalized groups in society. Um, so I'm very happy then to turn it over uh, to Jonah Montgomery for our final session of the day. Yes, thank you, um, everyone. Um, it was my ambition to be up early on a Monday morning uh, to see um, uh, the proceedings, but um, I think it'll be Tuesday morning I'll get up early because Monday is always a bit crazy with three kids <laughs> in the home. Um, can everyone hear me and see me okay? Okay, perfect. Sorry, this is a new webcam because um, the one on my uh, laptop's gone a bit uh, on the fritz. Um, so I want to thank uh, Neve and uh, the group at Crash for inviting me uh, along today. Um, uh, you know, I'm very uh, excited to have the opportunity to speak to, to, to such an interdisciplinary group uh, of people working on debt and austerity in different uh, elements, you know, as well as sort of social policy and so on. Uh, I've always um, valued uh, kind of interdisciplinary collaboration uh, on these issues. And uh, this work is a kind of, it's a chapter that I'm working on that's also part of um, uh, a grant application, which I'll, I'll get to at the end. Um, so I, I value all your input, uh, input and, and feedback as well uh, at the end. So um, <clears throat> I'm gonna try to talk for 40, 40 minutes, but you know how these things go. Uh, is all timed out in my head. Let's see how it uh, comes out in reality. Um, so I wanted to kind of set the stage for the talk to kind of think about this idea of, of again, crisis. So the, the underlying challenge, uh, I think, you know, I found especially, you know, it, it was really clear in 2008, you know, and really allowed us to kind of buy into narratives of like this world changing crisis and, and what's really happening. Um, and then as this austerity set in, it became clear that we were sort of trying to understand crisis as it was unfolding. But if we think about since 2008, um, again, we had a, a, about six years of austerity where there was sort of uh, an agenda to, uh, you know, of a, of a retrenchment in the UK, uh, which arguably, arguably kind of set up the, a particular set of, of political forces, you know, to bring about uh, the Brexit transition period, you know, with the referendum from 2016 to 2020, and this kind of protracted period of stagnation and uncertainty that's created, you know, as we, we go through sort of four years of pretending hard exit is not going to be the outcome. Uh, and, and then we have this, again, another acute period of crisis with the COVID pandemic, only to find ourselves again in this sort of post-2022 uh, 2022 age of the cost of living crisis. So it's again, this challenge of trying to understand crisis as it unfolds, um, but really kind of then, you know, it's also a kind of challenge to periodization. You know, I, I pick these as sort of events as if the events uh, come out of nowhere and, and there isn't a kind of um, a set of structural forces that are operating here, but just kind of crude periodization shows that, you know, there are these punctuated periods of intense crisis for, for, for two years, but those are then followed by these kind of periods of, of crisis and retrenchment of stagnation. So to really kind of think deeply about what is this condition of crisis? Uh, you know, why is it perpetual or what is its permanence? Um, and this is really to kind of engage with a kind of problematization of the, these kind of two overlapping um, sort of theoretical and conceptual registers that are not necessarily rivals, but um, they're, you know, where they overlap, when you bring them together, they create kind of this inclusive critique of, of uh, debt-led growth and austerity, which is the kind of idea of privatized Keynesianism uh, and a kind of policy regime that promotes debt 
uh, and the idea of neoliberalism, a kind of theory of neoliberalism, which is a kind of politics of market rule and how this benefits the already wealthy and how these two come together um, to, to kind of create only one real option for, for, for um, uh, reform in, in our current era. And crucially, you know, what I'm trying to do here is hone in on the really important role that policy plays. So again, it's not necessarily the state in general, it's, you know, kind of methodologically looking at public policy as a kind of form of statecraft, you know, a management of the domestic economy, like this domestic, you know, dom domestication of the national economy, uh, but also of the kind of populations within it, uh, and the role that the household plays in kind of as, as a fault line of inequality within it. So these are the, this is the kind of big frame of, of where I hope we get to at the end with some sort of provoking questions about the role of public policy and, and the kind of concepts we use to think about alternatives or a way out of uh, this kind of state of perpetual or protracted crisis. So again, the kind of main uh, conceptual frame that I'm using here is kind of building on the, the work that I've been doing since the, the financial crisis to talk about economic storytelling about debt. So to bring in the idea of politics and debt as a political formation and the role that economics plays as a type of language of ideas, concepts, and models that makes sense of debt within um, a kind of understanding of its role within the system. Um, so uh, this picture on the left, I don't know if anybody recognizes, or my left, sorry, I guess it's yours too. I've never thought of that. Um, but the image here is of the Phillips machine. So this is a kind of scale representation of, you know, people might recognize the Phillips curve or kind of economic uh, type of Keynesian uh, economic modeling. And this is the kind of model of the, the Keynesian economy, uh, you know, using um, like according to Phillips. And again, we can see here, you know, there's a kind of, you know, this is the machine age, right? There's an idea of a kind of self-functioning system that if there's problems, you can sort of tinker with policy, you can use different instruments to repair the system to function normally. Uh, and again, this is a, a, a kind of important part of, of the larger um, story about industrialization and what becomes financialization, about the kind of domestic economy, but also the domestic domestication of the household, again, as the site of unpaid labor. So, you know, the machine, the factory um, is, is paid and productive labor and, and the domestic economy as a kind of sum of productive and unproductive labor together. Um, and how it functions as a system. And uh, so this kind of systems thinking, uh, you know, really sees debt, money and so on playing a very functional role. So you end up getting, you know, when you apply these kind of concepts, you end up getting to what is a choice between debt or wage led growth, right? Uh, in the same way you end up to down to a fundamental choice of tax or spend, or what's the mix between them, right? So that's the kind of, um, uh, machine framing. And, and again, I want to synthesize the kind of feminist lens on, on social reproduction and their critique of, of, of Keynesian um, models and Keynesian theories to kind of look at the routines, rituals, and rhythms of everyday life and how these are the foundations of capitalist systems that become national and local at the same time. So look, thinking through feminist theories of care and social uh, reproduction to really, um, again, pull apart uh, the domestication of the public and the private household and the kind of systems uh, of domination that, that, that make these kind of key narratives in the economic storytelling about debt uh, and, and austerity and the choices made by the state. Okay, so again, we can understand uh, the household as a kind of key conceptual feature of uh, economic storytelling, economic models uh, and theory as well. Uh, the private household, again, even the public-private distinction, uh, of course, we're gonna jump over uh, 150 years of political theory on that for a moment and just uh, look at the kind of economic representations of um, the public and the private households as kind of functional to this machine um, of the domestic economy and how, uh, again, we, we can be well aware of that within neoliberalism, and again, the critique of, of, of privatized Keynesianism is again this um, very kind of pointed uh, criticism of the fallacy of applying 
uh, the rationale of the private household to the state and why this is sort of economically illiterate. Again, if you use the ideas and concepts and models of macroeconomics, you know, the very, you know, this is sort of a somewhat laughable way of, of, of pretending the state operates like, like a household when what makes the state powerful it's, is its ability to, to print money and pay its debts in the money that it prints. So, or, you know, it doesn't print, but it did at the time, but, you know, create money and, 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 and then have the currency to pay its own, its own debts in that, in, in that currency. So, you know, if only uh, households had that capacity. So this metaphor is kind of well known, but it's one of those um, really technical arguments that's a little bit clever by halves because it misses the kind of, you know, broader cultural critique of, of the state itself uh, and how it's very difficult when, uh, you know, individuals and households do operate with a balance and a, you know, a budget sheet to, to conceptualize the the state is something else. Um, you know, they're just projecting their own uh, understanding of the world. And I think that it's, you know, by unpacking um, the public and the private household and, and the, how their balance sheets are connected, um, rather than, you know, saying that it's a fallacy, instead to unpack this narrative and, and, and um, as part of economic storytelling about debt to kind of understand the power relations that are at play and, and the systems, um, of domination that are that are being activated uh, in order to kind of perpetuate and, and, and solidify this narrative as crisis is unfolding. And the reason, the justification for the household and why it's significant beyond a kind of um, rhetorical device to, to talk about economic illiteracy or the kind of, um, you know, the neoliberal um, vision of, of, of market liberalism uh, is instead to look at the household um, as a way of unpacking distribution, as a metaphor for unpacking distribution, who gets what, what goes where, and these kind of basic questions of distribution rather than um, simply about, um, you know, narratives of power. And when we talk about debt and it's the, how the public and the private uh, household are connected, this is really about these kind of registers of the budget sheet, which is about cash flow and cost of living, and the balance sheet, which is a you know a much longer time horizon of, of the lifetime, or if you're a, a state uh, for th you know three hundred years and into the future, um, a kind of lifetime of assets and liabilities. How you know these numbers are used to kind of calculate benchmarks to find kind of risk risk preferences or profiles, behavioral traits or investment strategies, but how it's all framed within this idea, either the budget sheet or the balance sheet of trade offs. Um, and thinking through how these, these sort of, um, you know, narrative around these numbers and these, these kind of registers of accounting registers is to look at how the domestication of the state and the market use kind of competitiveness and well-being as kind of rival uh, orders of economic worth. So again, when we um, use a kind of strictly sort of neoliberal privatized Keynesianism frame, you know, the phrase, it's about competitiveness uh, in a kind of global economy. But the only alternative to that really is a kind of well being or prosperity metric. Uh, and again, they become rival uh, orders that, again, uh, are not so different from each other. So, the, how this connects to the broader kind of theme of this uh, conference um, and, and what Neve and I talked about was to think through again how the, the public and the private household, how the, the, the budget sheet and the balance sheet and are, are connected uh, through this kind of moral economy lens of um, asking questions about you know, money and, and, and ethics and justice. Um, so again, the, using the feminist um, theory and feminist economics, you know, that starts with who's counted, right? So uh, Marilyn Waring, um, wrote the kind of, um, kind of definitive critique of Keynesian national uh, accounts from a kind of feminist economics perspective to look at um, what are the implications of not counting uh, domestic labor, unpaid labor in national accounts. And this kind of the way in which it structurally discriminates um, against primarily women, but anyone who provides unpa unpaid care or uh, low paid um, work in the home. Uh, within the kind of national uh, economic kind of um, 
national economic management. But to also bring within, you know, this kind of feminist frame of who is counted uh, and what, you know, and what is being counted uh, to the frame of who pays. And that's a kind of key element of what's been um, the kind of ethical and justice based dialogues around debt, right, is, and, and austerity is who pays. Um, so when we kind of think about these different normative frames and how they overlap or how, and again, and at those places of overlap where they become particularly powerful narratives is that on the one hand, you have this long overarching narrative about debt in general, and that's the kind of good credit, bad debt um, trade-off. So good credit is something that is needed to access sort of financial citizenship, whether a nation state or uh, an individual or, or household. And there's always some point, um, unknown sort of alchemy point that, that's always being sort of calculated and modeled and forecast uh, where some good amount of credit will become bad debts. Uh, when they can't be serviced, debt levels become problematic and this will be a trigger for, again, a, a condition of crisis. And how that arc you know, of good credit and bad debt just leads us to crisis, but then what happens in the long tail? You know, the long tail of austerity after crisis intervention when, when, when repayment has to, to begin. And that's you know, the question of austerity. And we think back to the Euro crisis and, and the national debt and, and you know, Lazzarato's um, <clears throat> uh, philosophies of, around indebted man and how you know, who, who uh, pays, right? And who is paying the national debt you know, and with what? Um, so you know, even it comes you know, in the UK as the kind of you know, uh, Mervyn King and um, Adair Turner sort of you know, wax lyrical now that they're out of these positions of power, power that you know, in the end, austerity means that those that didn't cause the financial crisis have to pay for it. So we have this kind of you know, um, the philosopher and the philosopher king sort of getting together to say, yes, austerity is really about you know, who pays uh, for, for, for the bailouts. But it all becomes a kind of episodic issue if you believe that 2008 is a one-off and, and ignore all the ways in which um, since 2008, um, public debt, sovereign debt has been used to continuously um, underwrite the global financial system. <clears throat> so bringing these two together, you know, the purpose here is then to kind of look through this question of who pays the costs uh, of the debt stock. So that's the kind of looking through uh, this idea of the perpetual crisis and, and you know, what's being fought over, what's the distributional question is, what are the costs of the debt stock and, and, and who's gonna pay it? So, you know, this is, a, you know, the kind of general um, kind of fundamental kind of question that I look at in my work that connects to, you know, what I've been doing now, but also kind of trying to apply it uh, through kind of uh, research is to kind of frame, you know, what is the kind of significance of debt in, in a system um, where wages and welfare, and then, you know, there's all kinds of kind of competing registers that could tell the same story. And why is debt the kind of linchpin to tell this story about who pays and, uh, and who pays what costs uh, and the role that the national, you know, that debt plays both public and private as a kind of political formation that is basically the justification for, um, you know, uh, inequality that gets worse and, and crisis that, that seems to never go away. So it is the case that debt is not new, but that the role it's playing in everyday life is different than what came before. Uh, and again, before what? Well, before um, you know, the, the 1970s and, and the kind of way in which uh, this shift that the privatized Keynesianism, neoliberalism tells, um, you know, the, the debt plays a different role in, in this period. So sovereign debt you know, is kind of a main asset that underpins the entire global financial system. Public debt uh, underpins the domestic currency and the economy, and it's at the center of resource allocation decisions by the state. So again, the, the state is making key decisions about what groups in society get uh, what access to, to, to state resources, and the public debt is a key kind of political uh, access uh, in the privatized Keynesian neoliberal period uh, for uh, justification of, of, of um, resource allocation decisions in favor of sort of corporate capital, that kind of element, 
uh, over the kind of private um, household. Um, within the, the private household, debt begins to replace wage gains. So, and again, it looks different in, in different um, uh, intergroup uh, within the, the, the national economy. So for middle-class, Debt is a way to access entitlements, the home, cars, vacation, uh, big ticket consumer goods. But for, work, for working class people, for um, without uh, wealth, debt is, is, is a means to survive, a means to, again, access uh, housing, transport, food, uh, and so on. But those in poverty, um, what they experience is exclusion from, from um, the kind of debt that could be used to replace wages. Um, you know, debt becomes fundamental to, to, to building housing, community systems, you know, over 30 years, uh, both public and private. Uh, I should put that there. But again, private debt also replaces uh, state welfare provision, the safety net, health and education, you know, student debts, uh, medical debts and, and so on. So that's a kind of key element of how debt has kind of configured in everyday life. But when we look at how it acts in these periods of crisis, I've just taken uh, this from um, the most recent crisis, uh, COVID, and then we can look at how we've kind of transitioned into a cost of living crisis. But this is again, the idea that debt, so what's significant about debt in, in this kind of period of privatized Keynesianism, neoliberalism, that makes it not functional. Like it's, it's, you couldn't just replace debt with money or debt with you know, uh, yeah, money, which could be wages, could be anything, could be state transfers. What makes debt different than just money um, is that it is like an agent of either fortune or misfortune. So it is the, you know, debt is, is a kind of key um, force acting within the system. Uh, it isn't just available, it's not just transactional. So if we look at, you know, the, the, the um, pandemic and what happens again in, in 2019. So we know that from 2008 uh, to 2010, there's this period of kind of both, you know, monetary and fiscal bailouts for, for, for the corporations, global corporations and, and, and markets, as well as kind of uh, different types of fiscal stabilizers for those two years after 2008. And then we transition into austerity. Um, but throughout that period, there are all kinds of monetary uh, injections, again, uh, you know, uh, tax incentives, all, you know, different privatizations initiatives, all different elements of the same agenda carrying through without crisis conditions. Um, and then, you know, when Brexit occurs, you can see, uh, again, 2016 monetary stimulus is again being used to, uh, <clears throat> you know, the British government is using um, the central bank and different fiscal levers throughout 2016 to 2020 to kind of try to shore up the national economy in the face of growing uncertainty because of Brexit. And then coronavirus hits and we have this pandemic um, response like in 2008. But initially what we see is that, um, sorry, this is the name of a report, coronavirus the impact on household debt and savings. So this is the initial government uh, report in the UK uh, that concludes that government action has forced savings. So this is the first, you know, I, I don't know if anyone remembers this kind of initial phase, which is they actually, um, uh, people are doing really well because of the pandemic, because they have, don't have so many costs. Uh, there's been all this forced savings. And again, this is the same sort of trick where uh, the wealthiest households are, are saving big amounts, but when you look at it across, you know, um, you know when you don't look at the distribution, uh, you know, with across households, you can make the, everyone look do, like they're doing well. So there's, again, there's a very sort of, here you can hear even within the technocratic language a very neoliberal view that um, the state, it's their actions that are causing this kind of buildup uh, of, of, of savings. So again, that's, you know, it's a real um, type of narrative around debt that, you know, the government can force savings, the government can, um, you know, uh, uh, rescue, markets and so on. But what we see with this ends up being four savings, what you know what they call the four savings is is sort of covering up the way in which or or sort of becoming a different story than what mechanism is allowing this to happen. It isn't just that we're locked down and consumption costs have, have plummeted. It's that um, 
also balance sheets are looking a lot better because of the amount of money that's being put in, in bailouts. So again, we can see that throughout uh, the first year, you know, in 2020, huge amounts of money are being poured from the central bank into um, financial markets, you know, using sovereign debt, using public debt. Um, it's being targeted at, um, you know, UK companies, you know, they're using all kinds of different mechanisms, but in the end, it's going to the corporate uh, sector, not the private household. So what happens is that, you know, by um, December 2020, the central bank uh, is sitting on, you know, 800, 895 billion in assets, uh, which is, you know, measured to be, you know, the equivalent of 19% of, of, of GDP, you know, contributing 90% of GDP to, to national wealth. So this is the central bank owning so many corporate assets that, uh, you know, it, it's actually, you know, equivalent to this significant portion of national wealth, you know, as measured in these national accounts that, that, that Warren is so critical of. But again, it becomes an estimate of just, you know, understanding how the state operates uh, and how its balance sheet is being used to um, just, again, underwrite um, corporate profits. Uh, whereas by contrast, uh, the private household, um, you know, rather than having forced savings, you know, I only took a few key figures here because I figured many of you would have uh, very up-to-date research that, that, you know, that I could uh, uh, on, you know, since the pandemic. But really just to, to, to contrast that, while the government was saying that there was this period of forced savings, um, more detailed survey research showed that um, at least a quarter of households had, had seen a uh, fall in income and half made cutbacks, including food and energy. So, um, they're taking the, the very wealthy who, um, who gained enormously um, from, from the state bailouts and, and response uh, and, and making that as the claim for, you know, the entire domestic economy benefited when uh, in reality, the majority had begun struggling from day one um, and or from, you know, quarter one, year one of the pandemic. Um, and again, through boring. So between January, so this is again, uh, if we just look from 2020 ends and the beginning of 2021, um, so we're, we're a year in, in that period, it is still 223 million per day is being lent to households. So there's all kinds of money being put in. Um, the citizens advice report the highest proportions of clients with negative budgets. Um, and then a year later, by May 2022, the total for, for lending was you know, 200 billion. So it's still going up, you know, still inching up. Um, and again, there, the, this is a, a story of how debt can either yield huge wealth gains, like, you know, as you know, if, if you're the one accessing debt via, via the central bank or, or the, 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 the payments, the yields from, from those um, debts, then it, you do very well. But if instead you're using debt just to get through on your balance sheet, then you're continuing to struggle. You, you know, you become underwater. So really, you know, the, the, the key facts are only to kind of really expose the way in which the, you know, money still operates as, as a system of domination that is taught as arithmetic. And that this arithmetic is fundamentally about a relationship between the public and the private household. Uh, without acknowledging the sort of ethical and moral economy frames um, that, you know, that underpin these claims. Austerity, you know, or retrenchment, the idea that you have to cut back your spending in order to pay down your debts is, is one of, of many forms of economic storytelling about the household and how debts are managed within it. And when we think about the UK debt stock and begin to unpack um, the public and the private household, I want to kind of begin to focus in on this idea of how the debts are cared for. This is the resource allocation question. So what debts are cared for and how, um, which are discharged? And um, again, who's paying? What are the costs? And, and you know, that's the, the amount, but the paying is, is, is the action uh, taken, the energy, the both paid and unpaid. But how this kind of uh, is about unpacking the different relationships of money and indebtedness across different scales. <coughs> Excuse me. So 
so what can we say about this, you know, the kind of underlying um, understanding of crisis as it's unfolding, it's perpetual, you know, it's, it's you know, uh, perennial nature, it's, it's permanence. Um, and here I sort of want to draw on uh, work that I did as a kind of um, public interest report with um, colleagues at, at Goldsmiths and, and some uh, looking at financial melancholia, this concept of this kind of psychological effects, like, you know, if we think about Keynesian animal spirits, um, you know, financial melancholia is to think about the collective uh, effects of being trapped by debt. Uh, again, how does the individual's perspective on debt become projected onto the state? Um, and, and similarly, how the state kind of projects austerity onto individuals is this idea that um, you're, you're working today to always pay for the past and how your future, you know, you can't have a future. I will never pay off my debts if all you're doing is, is trying to find money to pay uh, for the past. So how these kind of emotions and behaviors of individual financial distress are sort of domesticated in the national economy, but also in the home and how those justifications are, are ways in which austerity is imposed on a local, uh, local community, but also on the kind of address, the residential home as an address um, where you know, benefits are distributed, where uh, local services are accessed. Uh, and again, this is how debt becomes part of the story of spending cuts. So we have this kind of collectivization of sentiments toward debt that connects everyday economic activities of the budget sheet and cash flow with the kind of wider moral economy of debt of the national um, balance sheet, its cumulative uh, assets and liabilities. But ultimately, why debt is a political formation is because it is a, a key pillar of financialized expansion. Um, and, and that's why it is so um, a key political battleground for you know, at times of crisis and the need for intervention, but also in, in, in the, in the um, imposition of austerity, the kind of long tail of austerity after, after crisis. So this kind of um, brings me to the last kind of portion before I um, sum up, um, which is, you know, again, what, where does that leave us? Even if we have concepts and theories to kind of tell us about the unfolding of crisis, um, you know, where do we end up? I think, for me, the key uh, rationale for looking at economic storytelling, uh, rather, it, you know, is really to create that um, that sort of distance from 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 the logics that tell us about the system uh, that is that's operating, and the kind of political imaginary of alternatives. Because uh, again, I think this reliance on Keynesian frames. Uh, as a kind of rival to uh, neoliberalism is highly problematic. And, and that's because um, it really comes down to a basic rentier's critique, right? So the Keynesians, and, and again, I, I think many, many Marxists would fall into this category as well, where the argument kind of becomes one of, well, this is about national wealth. It's about, um, you know, the elites uh, or, or, uh, asset owners or um, bondholders is this kind of, um, you know, the type of capitalist or the type of, of capital that is held um, that are just, you know, hoarding the money and all we need to do is change tax and spend, right? That That's, oh, we just need to calibrate tax the wealth more, um, invest in jobs, you know, wage-led growth and, um, you know, and the, you know, again, the, the, the machine will start folk, you know, functioning better if we just tax the wealth, wealthy and let, um, you know, let individuals, um, you know, have higher wages and, and provide more public spending for, for services. And again, this is the Keynesian model, and it's not to say that it's bad or that it, it doesn't do those things. It's just that um, it didn't do them even in its heyday. Um, better than, you know, it, it's not enough uh, for what we need now. 
and looking back at this sort of Keynesian model and just the, the, the rentier's critique that if we just addressed wealth inequality, if we just ta you know, tackled the elites with kind of tax and spend measures that uh, you know, inequality would get, go down, there'd be no more crisis. But again, there, there are bigger issues. Obviously, you know, um, growth itself is a problem, but there's still the, you know, the feminist critique and the, the, the critique of inequality that says it is structural but that structural reform, you know, or reforming a system is not necessarily enough to address um, structural inequality. And I think that, again, where we lead to at the rentier critique is a, an idea that um, is, 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 is appealing as it is, is that technocratic uh, kind of Keynesian policies can be applied from the central bank and, and the treasury in a kind of top-down manner. And it won't just address indebtedness, it will address all problems, right? And and um, you know it'll, you know, uh, people struggling on low incomes, uh, people without public transport. And while I do think, again, I'm not saying that's incorrect. I I do think it is correct because you know the system does operate in a particular way that it would be very straightforward to make to implement a basic tax and spend uh, Keynesian model that would very quickly. Um, change the conditions of per perpetual crisis. But would it make the crisis go away? No, it would make it change form because it's precisely this sort of technocratic view um, rather than a democratic view of, of the economy as something uh, that is domesticated and, and for uh, the control of those um, that know better, that, that is, that is the, the kind of key moral economy issue because it precisely never addresses distribution because Rentierism makes distribution, again, a matter of accounting rather than a matter of social struggle uh, and, and the role of kind of settlement and negotiation between groups in society, regions, uh, uh, and as well, uh, you know, physical, you know, like spatial uh, uh, rivalries as much as, 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 as socio-cultural. Uh, and that, that this is, you know, what has to be addressed uh, the money is, is is an expression of that, or you know, the money on the, the national accounts is an expression of that. So to push past this kind of rentier critique is really to say that economic transformation is what's needed, not simply an you know alleviation of austerity and, and poverty. Um, you know, a new set of ideas, um, you know, ideas are crucial to transformation, but um, I think what we, you know, to understand the permanence of crisis is to also understand that the crisis response is a part of that permanence. So the boom, bust, bailout, austerity, um, you know, ratchet, you know, that, that, that continuously occurs uh, is one that uh, is created by the view that, that, that tax and spend and, and national accounts uh, is, is the way to address uh, conditions of crisis. So this kind of is the transition where I'm saying, well, if you wanna deal with the debts, it's not just enough to have another story. Uh, again, calling out um, the politics and the power struggle um, at the heart of it, it's about the kind of transformation and, and what that looks like without sort of just recreating the same conditions. So the, the grant application, you know, that the, the chapter sort of um, informs is really about getting to that place where we're looking at the alternatives and saying, okay, can eliminating the portions of the public and private debt stock act as a viable alternative to austerity and as a remedy for you know, what we consider the, you know, or is now called the cost of living crisis. Uh, and that sort of looking and applying uh, the, 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 the work that's out there on um, debt jubilee, um, quantitative easing for the people, different kind of proposals that seek to uh, address um, the problem of debt in, in, in contemporary Britain, but you know, also in um, the US uh, and, uh, and across kind of Europe and, and other, um, uh, yeah, uh, you know, the Anglosphere, the wider Anglosphere. Uh, and looking at all the examples of debt cancellation uh, and calls for both public and, and private debt um, abolition uh, or cancellation and, and, and thinking kind of sy systemically uh, about those examples and, and, and what the, the academic literature says. 
so that, you know, uh, I always like this um, is from Strike Debt. I'm sure you guys know, you know, you are not alone. Uh, but also this kind of idea for me of like, uh, I'm trying to think about the kind of modern day debtor's prison and, and what does that look like? Uh, you know, the modern day Marshall C. So, you know, within the academic literature, I won't go into too much uh, detail on this, but this is sort of the basic frame that there is um, between sort of 2017 and um, 20, uh, 2019, there were these four, you know, four books, mine among them, published on um, debt cancellation or abolition. Um, Jerome Ruse's book, uh, Why Not Default? Again, an ab, you know, just a, a fabulous book on um, sovereign debt. And again, who pays? Um, uh, sovereign debt and the kind of political struggles around that historically uh, and in the contemporary period. Um, and, and again, who pays and why? You know, why do some uh, states, you know, must pay uh, and, and others don't? And how, and how the argument of I can't pay with money, you know, we don't have uh, becomes, you know, part of a well-known strategy of, of sovereign debt default. Uh, but also repudiation and refusal uh, as a way of kind of engaging in power politics and, and, and the way in which kind of the neoliberal uh, market rule has sort of denied that, that history um, or, or treats it as sort of backward that, you know, we need a, a, a new world order where <laughs> contracts are con um, uh, Joe Spooner's book, Bankruptcy, is like the flip side of that, right? This is about bankruptcy. Um, should operate more like corporate bankruptcy. Um, and again, it's like looking at the private and the, and the, and the public household uh, and their sort of different bankruptcy regimes. Uh, and again, looking at how um, default is used and, and bankruptcy is used as a kind of counterweight to the power that the creditor has. Um, again, my own work on debt abolition, you know, asked the question about, you know, what would happen uh, if, uh, household debt was abolished. Uh, and then Michael Hudson's book is, is you know, if mine is sort of like a, a quick snapshot of the contemporary period, uh, Hudson's book on debt jubilee looks at the long history of, of um, debt abolition, you know, uh, it, it, you know is, 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 since time, you know, since records began basically. Um, so these were, you know, these books came out as a kind of, in many ways, a, a kind of full picture of the different types of thinking, uh, theories, examples, uh, and history of, of how to deal with debt. And um, so from this, uh, you know, I, I've sort of developed, you know, uh, you know, this chapter is sort of part of the, the case for support uh, that ends here, which is, you know, these kind of piloting modes of, of debt cancellation. So I took, um, you know, great inspiration from um, universal basic income uh, and, and different, um, kind of models of using kind of cash transfers, like, you know, uh, piloting cash transfers uh, <clears throat> to, to kind of think through how would you look at the question of what to do about, about debt cancellation? Because Roos does a great job of, of mapping sovereign debt uh, cancellation we have through Greece and so on and, and the highly indebted poor countries movement, uh, you know, uh, lots of examples uh, of, of sovereign debt cancellation. But when it comes to, to personal debt, um, you know, there's just different, uh, you know, different approaches. So this um, kind of pilot is looking at three kind of main modes of, of debt cancellation. Uh, the first is advice. And here I use sort of uh, advice, uh, uh, not exactly like the advice sector in the UK, but they overlap. You know, advice can be self-help or, or, or mutual aid, but this is, you know, basically using uh, the techniques of, of, of budgeting, household management, um, through kind of charitable or for-profit organizations, as well as just self-help, uh, and looking at this mode of, of, of canceling debts, right? The repayment, the austerity method. If you taught up all your debts and who you owe it to, you put it in a budget and you work over the long term to pay down your debt, um, you know, how you know how how does that work as a mode of debt cancellation? So again, it's it is the main mode, I would say uh, today, you know, if you're having problems with debt, this is the main way that you're gonna have to deal with it. Uh, and within the, the project, we look at this idea of money mentors, you know, the, um, as a you know, kind of form of self-help and how does that um, work, you know, this sort of you know, so, social method of, 
um, transmitting kind of you know techniques for for budget management and tracking those uh, as a kind of way of abolishing debt. Then the, the second mode is advocacy. So again, this is using legal and regulatory me uh, methods. So at times citizens advice and, and different uh, advice groups will, will move into this, which is again, uh, debt orders, um, county court judgments, you know, when you fall into kind of actually applying regulations and rules to debt, rather than just trying to manage it yourself. You can, you know, cancel debts related to rent arrears, utilities, uh, payday loans, support individuals to declare bankruptcy and so on, manage their debts. And, and how to kind of look at this um, particular form of, of debt management through kind of community-based uh, research um, and how, uh, you know, uh, uh, somebody, you know, with these talent, this kind of skill, are, are they able better than uh, the other methods to, to reduce um, debt over the long term? And then the final one would be model, this is the kind of model of cash transfers, actually using the money to eliminate debts uh, or a portion of them, either using the strike debt model. So in strike debt, they cancel debts that have already been discharged. So people who, who you know, they've already given up payment, but there's also this kind of French model, which is you self-nominate, you say, you know, I'm struggling with my debts. I don't want to discharge them. I rather than be canceled now uh, and, and, and walking uh, and looking at those kind of cash transfer methods uh, and, and doing ethnographic research, um, you know, to see uh, their effects. So that's kind of, the idea of like, how do we get away from the, just the simple rentier critique and the, and the technical fix, uh, you know, is to actually tackle forms of public and private debt. Because um, again, we know that when you eliminate sovereign debt, like with the highly indebted poor countries, um, you know, transformation occurs, uh, but we don't know at the private level. So it's about kind of looking at those options as a way of understanding that a crisis is continually unfolding or it's permanence that we have to look to the remedies that are being put in place for this condition and look to different remedies instead of um, trying to, you know, saying that the remedies would work if they were just applied better or applied in better context, which is basically um, what the argument is um, at the moment. So again, I'm not, I just wanna say, of course, you know, I believe in the Green New Deal and, and any of these kind of alternative visions because we do need well-being, we do need prosperity. But what I'm saying is that debt plays such a key role in the, the kind of privatized Keynesian neoliberal order that any tinkering with, with, with just technocratic measures is just that. It, it, it will just create debt in, in different conditions, you know, in different circumstances, and the problem will persist. So um, I think that's my 40 minutes, <laughs> uh, or five minutes. Um, yeah, so that, that, again, I tried to take, you know, over the arc of, um, uh, you know, the state of perpetual crisis uh, and the questions of who pays and, and how and what costs to this idea of, you know, if the national debt is, is, is a justification for austerity and personal debt is a justification for retrenchment, then the, the, the price, you know, the, the, the price of debt itself is you know what needs to be cared for. You know it becomes the key feature of the kind of political contest uh, over distribution. So the closer we look at debt, and the closer we look at the economic stories told about its costs, um, and and who must pay the debt, uh, often never asking who owns it. I always find that interesting. Um, but instead, you know who pays and and how much. Again, are key elements of how we understand this kind of point that's being made, you know, in front of um, the treasury, which is that you know life should come before debt, and that you know the the nation, the central bank, um, it, it is making a political argument that um, the owners of debt, again, the, the debtors' prison, the ones who own the debt, you know, their right to see. Um, some sort of um, payment, some sort of gesture uh, to guarantee their future wealth as a justification for, 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 for austerity, you know, whether that's the, at the, the nation state level or, or at the private household level. Again, this is 
the fundamental problem of the debtor prison, right? You never get out. Your whole future just becomes the gesturing and, and the, the gesturing of, of debt payment that, you know, I, I, I'm doing what I have to to pay this debt uh, only to kind of project that into the future and this kind of melan, you know, melancholia in which you can't even imagine a future um, because every day is about paying for the stock of debt. So when we put life before debt, we say, well, we can only pay with the money that's there and we can only pay with you know, what is manageable. So again, the, the, the solutions are at the moment for a kind of revised in, uh, in, in basic tax and spend measures, which are good, but they're not good enough because they don't address uh, the system of domination that, that debt implements. Uh, and that's why I want to pilot kind of different forms of debt cancellation so that um, it can add to more than just tax and spend. It can add to a form of economic transformation in which uh, who pays for debt is the ones who make so much of it rather than the ones who have a lot of it. So I guess that's me. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Jonah. Um... I'm really always interested in this question of the household and where where it figures into this problem, in part because it speaks to um, a serious question about reproduction and where reproduction, social reproduction and where that happens um, when when we're talking about crisis and the state of crisis. Um, and, and as a result, sort of conditions of possibility of, of the sort of perpetuation or disruption of, of economic structures, um, which we are, which we are ultimately talking about. Um, it's always struck me uh, that the, you know, the, the sort of the household metaphor and the state is obviously, as you pointed out, a very easy one to attack. And it became really prevalent uh, when we, when, uh, you know, with, with the election of the Thatcher government, obviously Margaret Thatcher's favorite metaphor was the idea of the state as, as a household. Um, and, and it was quite easy to say, well, obviously that's just fundamentally not the case because of the power that the state has to print money or issue bonds or or something like that. And of course, the real issue about what ultimately ended up happening to households as a result of that, the, the perpetuation of that narrative uh, is always um, quite an interesting one, particularly because of what was happening on a maybe more technocratic level. Um, Thatcher herself would certainly not, as we all know, have, have supported the extension of, of so much credit to households, but as, as a need to um, expand what, what the financial sector in the UK was doing and to make it competitive on a world on a world scale. This was this was something that was absolutely needed and it had very concrete and, and measurable effects for what's ultimately happened uh, with households access to debt. So I'm always really happy uh, when there's when when somebody takes very seriously um, what happens at the level of households and what what the responsibility of households is for for maintaining a debt um, and, and being responsible for something that ultimately came from without in in some in some cases so i really appreciate that that presentation and its contribution to uh the themes that we're getting at in this conference um obviously now wanted to to open the floor to questions um from from our participants today so uh yeah it looks like we have um one john paul Jonah, I really uh, enjoyed the presentation. I thought it was uh, uh, really insightful, analytically very rigorous and um, uh, very stimulating. Um, first, a uh, quick comment. Uh, I think for me, one of the things that has struck me most about um, living in an era of um, financialization, the financialization of everyday life, as Neve likes to put it, is the extent to which um, it politicizes futures and then with the way debt is structured, structuring obligations into the future, um, we get what I like to call a primitive accumulation of futures, whereby future possibilities for people are formally constrained, if, even if we don't know what the substance of that um, will be. Um, uh, also, when it comes to debt and uh, indebtedness of households, this is something I learned from Sam Gindin and Leo Panich. 
um, that at the household level, it's the wealthiest households that have the most debt. So the extent to which they're able to leverage um, assets that they have uh, makes it possible for them to accumulate more debt, but then to use that as a way to uh, live better, uh, accumulate uh, further assets, um, uh, what have you. So the um, well, one of the questions I think we have to ask uh, as social scientists is, well, how do we then measure um, dangerous or uh, averse indebtedness um, and the relative paucity of measures for wealth? Um, so debt is one thing, but then control and access to different classes of assets uh, also seems to be a, a major factor here. Um, uh, the main, main question, I'll, I'll have two questions. One has to do with um, class struggle over futures. So how do households manage the amortization of different types of debt or the way they think about it? So over the course of a working lifetime, uh, a mortgage cost, then the cost of children, university for the children, then saving for your retirement all at once. And what's your sense about how households think about um, or manage that? And second, um, listening to your talk, I was reminded of the debate about the third world debt crisis back from the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and uh, the supply side question, uh, which is why is it, or how is it that capital finance capital in particular has come to be so promiscuous in marketing um, and developing credit facilities such that, um, yeah, it's, it's easier for households to get access to different types of, of, of credit facilities. Um, is that because they don't see uh, banks uh, don't see oppor better opportunities for returns elsewhere. Um, so is this, um, yeah, what, what do you think that tells us about the broader political economy? Like why not invest in industry or why not invest in broader public assets? Okay, thanks very much. Excellent, excellent talk. Really appreciated that. Thank you, Jonah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a really good, that was a really great question. Um, I'll just start there and then, you know, if anyone else uh, wants, to, wants to come in. Um, so yes, again, the, the politicization of the future um, really sort of hits the kind of nail on the head, but also the, the, the element of the, the political theory I get a little bit nervous about, which is the sort of future, you know, the theories of the future. Um, and I think that that's only really because one of the main things I want to critique about um, economic storytelling, and in particular, this kind of macro, you know, the kind of macho macro framing that they use of the kind of domestic economy as, 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 as their domain, um, you know, again, is about um, how they use prediction, right? Again, how modeling and prediction, you know, so their sort of form of future thinking is really the only one that is listened to at the state level, right? It's, um they're the ones making the predictions about well if you don't do this then this will happen and if you don't you know it's that kind of like you know they have this register of future prediction that really dominates state real resource allocation so i always feel like if i try to take them on with the household you know i can't you know their theory of the future is also a kind of rival one and um so i just try to do it you know is in debt in in the it's lisa atkins and and uh, i think it is Debt in the Time of Money, time, The Time of Money is her book, but she does some really great kind of thinking through, you know, how debt, um, you know, takes, uh, you know, fits into these kind of theories of, of the future. Um, but yeah, I, again, and I think that the, the primitive accumulation of, of futures is a, is a kind of, it really made me think again of like student loans um, as a kind of, um, a kind of how do you, how do you, or again, the, uh, you know, first it started with saving for your kid's future, but it turns out that, it, you know, the cap is so low that <laughs> they don't want to give you tax breaks for that much, but, uh, you know, it, that it's just boring um, to, to, to kind of access, um, you know, what is a kind of middle class entitlement, right, uh, education. But uh, one of the interesting things that, that, that came up, again, in the pr primitive accumulation of futures is uh, in Wales, they have um, a minister for future generations. And, um, you know, she's not a minister of youth. She's the minister of fu future generations. 
And, you know, hearing her speak and kind of the logic of why, you know, this position came up in the devolved, the devolved um, administration is again, you know, the kind of preservation of, of, of wealth, wealth culture, wealth culture uh, and so on. But really, you know, she saw her role as, as this kind of guardian of the accumulation of, 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 of the futures of, of, of Welsh, Welsh children who were like being signed up for debts to go to university and being, you know, it's just like their whole life was being chosen for them by, the government in Westminster for how they were going to get what their parents had, you know, without accumulating a huge amount of debt. So I think that that's a kind of interesting, you know, that's what I thought when you said that is like, there's this kind of prospecting of we've got, you know, debt merchants, you know, the, 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 those that, 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 you know, are, are making debt products, you know, the, per, the promiscuous lot, you know, the, the very promiscuous <laughs> debt merchants, um, you know, they, you know, again, they, they have a really good, racket of just um, getting you to pledge your future work but what happens when you're a student is we don't know what that work's going to be so now we have to engage in all kinds of weird quantification about you know what your degree will be worth and so on um, but really you know it's like well okay we'll take your future income in 10 years um, but now it's like oh we'll take your future income in, in 10 years, you know, in 30 years, and now everybody's got a claim on the future income. And if you look at young people today, you know, it, it used to be that they say, oh, you know, it's your first time away from home. Uh, you're gonna get debts. You know, there, there was always this image of like, um, you know, like almost like Tara Nullis of the undergraduate student sort of turning up, freshly emerged as a financial citizen, no bank account, no financial independence. And that's untrue. You know, Zaloom's book on, on student debt shows families are in debt. You know, they're making decisions about one kid can go to university with these bills. You know, like it's negotiated at all kinds of level, again, based on class. And so I think that that's the kind of segue, right? Is that the merchants of debt, and you know, and that's the work of, of, of James Wood, you know, which again is excellent. And, and, and although, you know, I do critique the rentierism, you know, it's still the point is well made, which is that the, you know, the merchants of debt, the one, those that are, are able to trade in the discount window, they get sovereign debt directly from the, 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 the government. They pass it on to, to individuals as mortgages, credit cards, you know, they back student loans. Um, for them, debt is big money. It's the, it's the agent of fortune. It's not just that they're borrowing. It's that the asset side of their balance sheet is entirely debt stocks, the payment of the debt. And then they borrow of other people's debt you know, through leverage. So, you know, that point about the, you know, the, like, what is wealth really made of, you know, how much of it, you know, is um, assets, you know, as, as, you know, again, as it would have been understood even in Keynesian times versus just this cash flow of, of, of yield payments and, and fees and so on that they're passing along and how quickly that will dry up, you know, um, uh, you know, when, it, you know, very soon, but we leave that for another day. And I think that it's those kind of debt, you know, as you know, the merchants of debt and how they make a fortune, but also, you know, the misfortune of those who are the holders of that debt to, to have to negotiate um, never with the creditor directly, but actually with the state. And I think that's really important because what does the student loan regime in Britain do that in America it could never do because it was implemented 30 years before was to say actually the treasury is going to collect that money because it turns out the university is a public institution in Britain and has granted all kinds of tax advantages for being such so it cannot you know uh, participate so they allow the government privatizes the loan book and and allows the treasury to collect debts now there's no better way to you know if you want to be promiscuous you know, there, there's not a lot of people that, that want to get into bed with somebody who's got a, a product that doesn't collect interest and it goes for 30 years and it's never been formulated. They said, don't worry, the treasury collects the debt. It comes directly off the pay packet. So again, you, you know, this is about the kind of, um, you know, the, the state's capacity to kind of mobilize class structures, you know, and to implement these forms of, of inequality. And so, you know, I think that's key is to understand that how the state is, is underwriting this debt, how it's supporting it, is a key way in which class structures are mobilized to kind of make these different effects of debt. And again, the, the you know, Gindin and Panich, uh, you know, 
again, they make this point, uh, so does Costas, about the problem of scale, right? And, 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 but it's like they almost only stop at the wealthy. I think that's my criticism. It's like, look at the uber wealthy and look at how, how rich they are, but they forget to go all the way down uh, the, you know, the social stratification and the hierarchy to say that, you know, again, the problem of debt and scale is that, yeah, the wealthiest people have the most amount of debt. It's another way that they say, oh, the most amount of debt is for your home, right? So it's safer, right? So, you know, and, and the wealthiest people have mortgages, you know, isn't that great? Uh, you know, so it means they're wealthy if they even have one. So it's all that ways the debt stock itself becomes sort of cut down into different, you know, moral registers uh, based on a kind of class structure um, that basically kind of says, you know, um, you have a lot of debt, uh, you know, again, it's not on the, you're not looking at the asset side, how much of other people's debt do you own? It's the debt that you have. And if you have a lot of debt, even as a middle-class person, it's your house, so it's fine. But they're never asking you, how much are you paying for that debt? Because again, corporate actors pay, you know, significantly less. So that's the kind of terms of credit. Uh, how long are you paying that debt? And how much unpaid labor, how much unpaid care and work is going into servicing that debt? Um, you know, these are the benchmarks uh, to kind of show that, again, it doesn't matter the amount of debt. It, it, these are the things that matter. So, again, the problem of scale is really one to kind of show that if we look at debt all the way uh, through the different kind of social stratifications, we can see that it plays a really um, key role at sort of exploiting these structures, uh, you know, and, and reinforcing, reproducing them. Uh, in society uh, that, you know, when there was wage leg growth, when there was Keynesianism and so on. So I think that that's, you know, a really important point that uh, it kind of just continues to reproduce these, these ideas. Thank you, love that point about scale all the way down. Uh, very, yeah. very well put, thank you. Mia, would you like to go? Hi, Donna, thanks for that. Really thought provoking as always. Um, I have a question. I'm not well versed in this, so I, I, I kind of um, have heard people argue, of course, that inflation also isn't like a really, you know, that that sovereign states have consciously promoted inflation to inflate away um, debt in previous eras, and of course, you know that that whole argument is it, kind of interesting in terms of. Um, you know, a, yet again, another difference between um, uh, sovereign state debt and uh, household debt is not only do households not create their own currency, but nor do they control inflationary pressures as well. And, you know, independence of central banks, notwithstanding and all that. But um, I, I, I also think, you know, A, that that probably is or has been at points part of the story, but also that the distributional and class kind of component of that is rarely um, explored as part of that. And I just wondered if I could ask you to kind of reflect on that a bit. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, uh, it reminds me of, uh, Gre you know, Greta Krippner's book, The Capitalizing on Crisis. Um, Cause she sort of does the, this argument through the 1970s, you know, looking at the, the, the low, you know, the high interest rate kind of environment and, and how that kind of the small savers and how people are sort of, you know, how it plays yeah. out differently across the, the, the class structures uh, in America. Because here it's like we're, we're coming up on these same tensions, but, but, but playing out again differently because the, the you know, the te technical measures are applied differently. So again, the, firstly, the economic storytelling within Keynesianism about this relationship between inflation and interest rates, right? It's like arithmetic, right? It's, it's mathematical laws, it's, it's model laws, right? These are not politically negotiated terms. These are, you know, market rule and, and inherent logics of the machine that are operating. And remember that, you know, within that Phillips machine, what you're tinkering with is like, ooh, inflation's high, got to let a little pressure out. Ooh, interest rates are, are a little low, let's jack that up a bit. You know, and, and this idea of, you know, that's what the, 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 the Keynesian technocrat is doing. But what we see here is that um, from 2008 
you know, again, low interest rates are used as a form of corporate bailout um, from 2001, right, right from the tech bubble. As soon as we're getting this mass investment culture, you know, uh, you know, this is the, the middle class uh, portfolio investment and, and, you know, then becomes a residential investment, you know, as finance is creeping deeper and deeper into everyday life, the justification for the state to act the bailout. So the first time whole market bailouts or interest rate cuts are used is 2001. Because before they would just use debt restructuring, right? They change the interest rates on all the debts a kind of bad corporation had or, a, you know, a whatever. But now, you know, with 2001, it's like, well, you know, we'll just cut the interest rate and everyone will get lower debt and then they can refinance their own loans. Um, but that works in 2001, 2008. It's not interest rates have not really, you know, the whole point was that it was the ticking up of interest rates that triggered it in the first place. So interest rates stay low and now they have quantitative easing. This stays pretty permanent, you know, with different injections at different times uh, within the global uh, financial system. Um, but high interest rates is because they can't do QE anymore. So how else do you get revenue into the banks? If you're not just going to buy their, their assets that are worth nothing, if you're not just going to say, hey, you got shit assets, I buy them all. Whatever, <laughs> I give them all here. Uh, and I'm not going to say, here, you want money? Here's some, here's some reserves. You want some reserves? I got reserves. That's not working anymore. So instead they say, no problem. All the debts that you have, all the assets you currently own and all new ones, because everyone has to refinance at some point, you'll get more revenue, higher interest rates, right? So again, it's still resource allocation by the state, it's still um, political decisions, but you'll never find a policymaker in the treasury or the central bank that even has the capacity to admit they're part of the problem because they see themselves as the savior of the system, not as the fools that are making you know, you know, us all suffer from you know, their debunked theories and, and models being applied. So, you know, I think that that's, again, it's really important and it, it is part of that economic storytelling. Inflation and interest rates are like these key kind of words that are told about the debt and why it's so important and why we got to do this now. And right, there's no other choice, right? There's no alternative. There is just, um, um, you know, uh, the debt's expensive now, so we're gonna have to cut. Uh, you know, debt's only cheap when corporations are collapsing, then it's cheap. And then, you know, uh, when the state's in trouble, we jack it up. So I think that, again, if we get back to resource allocation, we can see that higher interest rates are just a QE by other means, by, you know, allowing those that own debt to have more, to expect more revenue in the future, not less, um, you know, so that they can weather uh, the down, the, you know, the, the, the downturn. Yeah. Ariane, do you have a question? I do. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I was just checking the time to make sure that I don't, I did decide what I wanted. A really exciting talk. So thank you so much, Jonah. Um, as somebody who is mid career and only one year away from paying off their student debt, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> you know, very invested on a personal level. Um, I just have a quick comment and then a, a question. The, the comment I had, I'm looking forward to reading your uh, paper on um, financial melancholia. I, I, I have no idea how indebted it is to the Freudian term, but I was, I was like, I wonder what financial mourning would be and what, how would we make that determination? But anyway, I'm, I'll, I'll read that paper. Thanks uh, for, for we're highlighting for that. The, we're, main, we're mourning for the future that will never be. Oh yeah. Mm. yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah. I mean, I don't like it in principle, right. but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, I do. yeah, no. And, and my question just comes from a kind of more like critical theory, critical sociology kind of standpoint, which is like, I was wondering if you had some, uh, uh, you know, ideas about, you know, these kinds of pilot modes that you've suggested. And like, do you have some ideas about which mechanisms would have to be targeted you know, or like, like, how do we get there? Because at this, you know, I, I think there are really interesting, you know, pilots and, and maybe, maybe there's a bigger part of the story that I've missed, but I was really interested to kind of think about like what particular kinds of mechanisms in the broader social structure need to be targeted in order to actually realize these really interesting uh, solutions you proposed. Oh yeah, okay, no, that's great, yeah. Um... Because I do, I try to like frame it like action, community-based research. So again, like focusing on the key elements. So, um, 
with advice, again, the key th element here is like um, uh, everyday expertise. So um, in the work that I've done before, there are these kind of, again, the, the orthodoxy or the kind of established mode of giving advice, like what is permissible and how that differs, um, especially in times of crisis and, and what's happened since with the kinds of advice that are given, um, you know, the informal or, you know, non-official advice, like, you know, have you tried, uh, you know, don't, um, what's a big one that they use in the UK? Um, don't pay off your credit card if you have council debt arrears. Or if you have council debt arrears and credit card arrears, pay off all your council debt with your credit card and then let that be your one creditor because you know, official advice doesn't differentiate between who can, who can come after you hardest, who can hurt you the most. So you know, again, and it's the problem of scale, you can have people who have big amounts of debt that they're working really hard to pay off and a small amount of, of council debt and that's what pushes them over. So again, it's that kind of, the, the advice one is looking and specifically looking at everyday expertise, not the not necessarily the official advice. So it's not following just what citizens advice says, but taking that remit. So they have very key things in common. One is the budget sheet. So again, a basic budgeting technique, what's included in there and what's not. Um, and again, imagining the motions. So and imagine, you know, the feelings, the home, the, un, the, un, the unpaid element of it. This is where advice is um, you know the the kind of like I said it's the most common way people deal with debt so it has the richest kind of resources but what you find in this kind of everyday uh, debt advice is again this recognition that you know you need to go bankrupt if you are you know if you won't open your letters if you are scared if you can't you know it's like they have this kind of recognition of the, the, the cost paid by debt and saying if you are paying any of these costs take, take the easy out, you know, or not the easy out, but to, you know, take the out, just tap it out and say, you can't go because that's what it's there for. Whereas official advice will very rarely push anyone in that road. It's like pay, 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 pay till you can. So it will be about measuring, you know, when, you know, not just how much debt is paid down, right. You know, but what advice leads to what decision. So if they do then move to, uh, a kind of advocacy where they're moving into to bankruptcy or, or debt orders, you know, does that happen or is it just, you know, pay it down through support and, and so on. Um, and the advocacy one is actually measuring uh, or trying to look specifically at the actions. So are they regulatory actions? Are they legal actions? Are they negotiated settlements? Um, you know, which are the ones that lead to debt cancellation, you know, in amounts, but also in terms of, you know, um, you know, the, the, the wins, they call it the easy wins versus the long road, you know? Um, and then the, the, the cancellation, I mean, to be honest, that's the one that everyone has a problem. Like every time you send it out to Rue, it's like, no one's going to fund this. No, <laughs> no one's going to fund cash transfers to pay other people's debts. You know, and it's like, if you read about the UBI, everyone would say that too. Like no one's going to, um, agree to just paying people money. We did that already. It didn't work, you know. Um, so, you know, how do you finance it uh, and so on? But uh, again, just using the kind of the strike debt model for me is a good one because, again, it's already canceled debts, but it it has already been shown to kind of have a limited impact because it's one, you know, it's a bunch of debts that are, you know, are sort of bundled together it's hard to measure the effect on the individual households. So the idea would be like, are you already, you know, if you're already in a um, debt arrears, if you're already, you know, past due, um, would just direct debt, debt cancellation uh, be more effective than this kind of long, long process? Um, but also, can you just self-nominate? What about people who just don't want to go into bankruptcy? It's like, listen, I got bad debts. Uh, I'll take no credit rating for, you know, just, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, we'll take the punishment, but it's like, they want people to go through this really difficult process. Um, so I'm trying to look at ways of just transferring money, but also that, you know, try to, you know, if it never doesn't come through to just look at bankruptcy as that option, but, but ideally I'd like to just use uh, like with cash, you know, just cash transfers to pay off portions of people's debt to see if that actually has, um, 
you know, a positive impact on their, not just on their balance sheet, but on, on the overall well-being. So it's kind of mirroring these different ones just to, again, it's a pilot to create a, a more comprehensive set of understandings about the different tools and, and what their impacts might look like. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, use, yeah, again, it's using sort of action-based research and a kind of ideas around uh, restorative justice where the kind of unspoken feelings and trauma or you know, actions of, of debt repayment are sort of given space you know, as part of the process is like working through an understanding of what has happened, where you are and how you get past it rather than just the numbers. Do obviously have time maybe for one more question if anybody has any. Obviously, I'm also conscious of the fact that a lot of people have been here from the beginning, and so it, it might be a long day in addition. Um, but you're forgiven for not having. You don't please don't be nice to me if you're if you're tired and you're hungry and you're thirsty. Uh, yes, I'll be here tomorrow. Um, thank you, everybody, for for your input today um, and for your participation. It has been a very interesting set of discussions today. Um, and thank you obviously to uh, Daniel and to uh, Jonah for their, uh, for their uh, keynote talks today. Um, very, very thorough, very enjoyable. Thank you, Dean, for organizing everything. I know it's not easy <laughs> to get all of us to sit down in the same place at the same time. So thank you so much. Yes. That's well, fun. this is yeah, this. Well I will learn, I'm sure, about organizing a conference single hand. Don't worry, it never gets easier, it just gets bigger. Yes. <laughs> you just start you small. <laughs> yes. See you tomorrow. Um, yes. Thank you everyone for today and hope to see most of you tomorrow as you can.